<laughs> All right, good, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this Tax Policy Center event, not just the people here in the room, but uh, the people online as well. Uh, we welcome you. I'm Bill Gale, the co-director of the Tax Policy Center. It's my honor uh, to welcome you here this morning uh, to talk about a new book. Uh, Michael Gretz is the author. The title is The Power to Destroy, uh, How the Anti-Tax Movement Hijacked America. Uh, I uh, should mention at the outset that if you're interested in purchasing a copy of the book, uh, it's on sale at the bookstore uh, outside the auditorium. Uh, and I just want to start with a few words of introduction. Uh, there are many uh, variables in tax policy, but there's at least one constant, which is that if Michael writes a book, you should read it. <laughs> Michael's books combine history, sociology, politics, tax law, and great storytelling. Uh, and this book continues in that tradition. Uh, when Michael told me last fall he was working on this, I asked him if we could do uh, a book event uh, when the book came out. And this event, uh, just before tax day, uh, is, is the outcome of that discussion. Uh, by way of introduction, uh, for those of you who for, don't know who Michael is, he is the current, currently the Columbia Alumni Professor Emeritus of Tax Law at Columbia University. He joined Columbia in 2009 after 25 years at a small law school in Connecticut, uh, Yale. Uh, during the Bush One administration, he served as assistant to the secretary and special counsel to the Department of Treasury in 92 and as deputy assistant secretary for tax policy uh, from 1990 to 1991, which is actually when I met him because I was a, a senior economist uh, at CEA at the time. Michael's been elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He's been chosen as a John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Fellow. He has received the Tax Foundation's Distinguished Service Award, and most importantly, the National Tax Association's Daniel M. Holland Medal uh, for Lifetime Achievement. Uh, just a quick couple of housekeeping items. Michael will present the main themes from his book over the next 20, 25 minutes. Uh, and then we'll have uh, a panel discussion I'm very, what I'm very much looking forward to, moderated by David Wessel, uh, including Stephen Dean, Doug Holtzikin, my colleague Vanessa Williamson, and Michael himself. So uh, with that, let me welcome Michael and turn it over to him. Thank you. Don't think I'm doing this without notes. <laughs> I want to thank Bill uh, for not only uh, sponsoring this event, but for his enthusiasm for the book, um, which he showed from an early draft, uh, which hopefully has been improved since he's seen it. Uh, and I want to thank uh, Doug and, and Steve and Vanessa for being on the panel. I've always found that it's better to thank the panelists before they attack you rather than after they attack you. Um, so my book traces the history of the modern anti-tax movement from the late 1970s until April of 2023. From its fledgling days as a fringe theory using coded racial language to its breathtaking success in transforming the U.S. government into an underfunded and perhaps unsustainable enterprise. Along the way, I introduce a cast of characters whose dedication to the anti-tax movement made the revolution possible. My book also describes some of the conservative 
machinery that funded and promoted and coordinated efforts along the way. And it describes how Democrats helped pave the way. In the time I have here, I obviously cannot explore um, in detail the events that I describe in my book. Um, sorry. Um, or even bring to life all of the people who made it happen. But I can shed a little light on some of the book's fundamental claims. On the first page, I describe the anti-tax movement as the most important overlooked social and political movement of the past half century. When I've asked people to name the most important social and political movements of that time, they unsurprisingly answer the civil rights movement the women's movement, the LBG, LGBTQ movement, I always stumble over that, the Christian evangelical movement, the environmental movement, and recently the MAGA movement. But no one has ever mentioned the anti-tax movement. Like all social movements, some anti-tax advocates have acted out of self-interest some out of firm ideological commitments. The modern anti-tax movement began in 1978 with the enactment of Proposition 13 in California. Three other important anti-tax events occurred that year. First, the entry of Christian evangelicals into the Republican anti-tax and importantly, anti-IRS coalition because of their virulent opposition to proposed IRS regulations denying tax exemptions and charitable deductions that had supplied their financial lifeblood to so-called segregation academies that were created in the South in response to the Supreme Court's school desegregation decision nearly 25 years earlier. Second, the electoral success of large tax cuts proposed by Jack Kemp and William Roth, perhaps most importantly, the surprising primary defeat of Clifford Case in New Jersey by Jeffrey Bell. And third, the success of Wisconsin Republican Bill Steiger and getting a Democratic Congress to enact a capital gains tax cut. Bob Bartley, the longtime Wall Street Journal editor, described 1978 as a remarkable turning point for tax policy. Why was 1978 such an opportune time for the anti-government, anti-tax movement to emerge? During the 1970s, the American public had seen important government failures, the Vietnam War, Watergate, Richard Nixon's resignation, and numerous corruption scandals involving other politicians. Simultaneously, the nation's economy was suffering from stagflation a combination of high inflation and high unemployment that Keynesian economists had insisted could not happen. They said we could have either high inflation or high, high unemployment, but not both together. There were also widespread perceptions that welfare and Lyndon Johnson's Great Society programs disproportionately benefited people of color. The civil rights movement and the women's movement had disrupted long-standing social, family, and economic arrangements. Affirmative action in higher education and employment also divided the nation. White men felt threatened by new, composition, new competition for jobs from minority and women workers. Immigrants no longer came predominantly from Canada and Europe but instead from Latin America, 
the Caribbean, and Asia. Together with school busing, this changed the composition of public schools and of the workforce, fomenting anti-immigrant, anti-government, and anti-tax attitudes that profoundly affected the nation's policies and politics. Many white Americans believed others were cutting in line and blamed the government. They did not want to pay taxes to finance expanding public benefits for black or Latino people or for the salaries of the government workers distributing them. Anti-tax advocates from Howard Jarvis in California through the Tea Party have labeled any government redistributive spending, especially for the poor, as socialism. And they linked tax cuts to addressing government waste, fraud, and abuse. Ronald Reagan famously repeated stories of an unnamed fraudulent welfare queen with 80 names, 30 addresses, and 12 social security cards, of course, driving a Cadillac and collecting veterans' benefits on four non-existent husbands. A generation later, in 2012, Mitt Romney, singing from a similar songbook, separated the makers from the takers, telling his supporters that there are 47 percent of the people who will vote for President Obama no matter what because they are dependent on government and believe government has a responsibility to care for them. These are people who pay no income tax. Efforts to divide the us who pay taxes from the others who depend on government handouts, often with racial undertones, has long been a hallmark in framing anti-tax attitudes. Successfully framing an issue, however, does not suffice for a social or political movement, especially one dependent on legislative achievements. Such movements also need leaders and resources, and moral or ideological commitments, narratives to explain why the changes advanced will be good for the country. Finding resources to support tax reductions is child's play. Money to fund such efforts readily flows. Important media allies also promoted the anti-tax movement. In the late 1970s and early 1980s, when it was the only national newspaper with a large influential readership, the editorial pages of the Wall Street Journal led by Robert Bartley and Jude Winiski, played a crucial supporting role. After Winiski was fired for his open support of Jeffrey Bell's anti-tax Senate campaign, he wrote a very successful book, modestly entitled The Way the World Works. There, Winiski insisted that the decline and fall of the GDP I'm sorry, the decline and fall of the GOP. <laughs> there is a difference. The GOP, since 1930, resulted from its failure to understand the nature of the Laffer curve. Later, Fox News was influential, urging people to, in, to join the large April 15th Tea Party rallies. From 1988 until his death in 1921, 2021, sorry, Rush Limbaugh told his 20 million listeners that the progressive income tax was a, quote, assault on achievement. You should never accept the silly notion, he said, that there is poverty and suffering in America because you are greedy and not paying enough in taxes. Echoing a long-standing anti-tax myth, Rush insisted charts and graphs can prove that tax rate reductions enhance revenue. Howard Jarvis in 1978 was an unlikely leader for the anti-tax campaign. He started out as a small Utah newspaperman, 
and briefly served as a functionary in Herbert Hoover's campaign. His anti-government attitudes became fixed when the government seized the latex from his mattress plant for World War II, but never used it, and then took its time in compensating him for it. Before his success with Proposition 13, Jarvis unsuccessfully had promoted four previous tax limitation measures in California. An income tax limitation measure pushed by Ronald Reagan when he was governor of California and supported by Jarvis also failed in 1973. But in 1978, Jarvis's property tax limitation measure passed overwhelmingly with 63% of the vote. Soon after that, Jarvis's photo was on the cover of Time magazine under a bright yellow banner shouting tax revolt. Within four years, 34 states had adopted property tax limitations or supermajority tax or supermajority legislative requirements to raise taxes or both. Proposition 13's reach was expanded again in 1986 and in 1996. And in 2020, California voters rejected an effort to lift its limitations on the property taxes of large commercial businesses. While Jack Kemp, a then a backbench Republican congressman from Buffalo, was developing his proposal to cut income taxes by 30 percent. Arthur Laffer, a quirky, obscure economics professor at the University of Southern California Business School, unveiled his famous curve and began proselytizing that revenues would increase by cutting tax rates. His supply-side compatriots, including Norman Touré, Paul Craig Roberts, and Larry Kudlow, all of whom who served in the Reagan administration, urged that the tax cuts be focused on owners of capital, investors at the top of the income scale. Ronald Reagan, then president, needed no convincing. He always repeated stories of his days in Hollywood, where he said everyone stopped working after the third movie because the top tax rate, which was then 91 percent, made it foolish to work on a fourth movie. During Reagan's presidency, the top rate on investment income was reduced from 70 percent to 28 percent, and on labor income from 50 percent to 28 percent. During Reagan's time in the White House, taxes fell from just over 19 percent of GDP to 17.8 percent, and the national debt tripled from $900 billion to $2.7 trillion. When asked if he had any regrets about his time in office, Reagan replied, the deficits. Addressing the deficits and the burgeoning federal debt became the principal fiscal challenges for Reagan's successor, George Herbert Walker Bush, who famously broke his no new taxes pledge to reach a deficit reduction agreement with a Democratic Congress. Bill Clinton in 1993, after promising a middle class tax cut, raised the top individual rate to the now iconic 39.6% and proposed a broad-based energy tax that narrowly passed the House but failed in the Senate. Clinton's tax increase proposals helped elect a Republican House of Representatives in 1994 for the first time in 40 years. Newt Gingrich, an intellectual shapeshifter who had ostentatiously betrayed President Bush and had rallied Republicans against the 1990 budget agreement, became Speaker of the House. In 1997, Gingrich obtained a capital gains cut in exchange for Clinton's tax incentives 
for higher education. Newt's friend, Grover Norquist, came to, the anti came to his anti-tax fervor quite naturally. When he was a child, when his father took his family to the local Dairy Joy for ice cream, he would take one lick of Grover's cone and say, this is the federal tax. <laughs> then another lick and say, this is the state tax. And a third lick saying, this is the city tax. Grover became famous for his anti-tax pledge, signed by Republican presidential candidates, federal and state legislators, and governors, promising never ever to vote for raising taxes no matter the economic or fiscal circumstances. The pledge even bans closing loopholes unless they're offset with a tax cut. More than 1,800 elected Republican officials have signed Grover's pledge, including 42 current Republican senators, 191 representatives, and 18 governors. In 1993, Norquist began holding Wednesday meetings in Washington and in state houses around the country to bring together Republican operatives and other leaders of the Republican right. Grover says they all want government to go away. 60 Minutes described Norquist as the single most effective conservative act activist in the country. Arianna Huffington dubbed him the dark wizard of the anti-tax cult. In the late 1990s, Republican congressional leaders and presidential candidates traveled the U.S. arguing that we should substitute a flat tax on consumption or a national sales tax for income and estate taxes. Steve Largent, an Oklahoma congressman, who was better known for his football career than his legislative accomplishments, along with Texas Senator Kay Bailey Hutchison, pushed a bill that passed the House in 1998 that would terminate the existing tax law in 2000 without specifying what would replace it. The bill failed in the Senate on a 49 to 49 tie vote. In this century, George W. Bush made large tax cuts on income and estates the centerpiece of his presidential campaign. In 2001, with some help from some Democrats, most notably Louisiana's John Bro, Congress enacted Bush's tax cuts. This law ushered in extraordinary phase-ins and sunsets, disguising its true cost. It ended up costing about $8 trillion by the end of 2023. Bush's war on terror after 9-11 also cost about $8 trillion, and it was the first war of the nation without any tax increases to help pay its costs. In 2003, Congress enacted a new prescription drug benefit for Medicare, the first new entitlement without a tax to help pay for it, and added more tax cuts that year, reducing the tax rates on capital gains and on dividends. Toward the end of 2007, the great financial crisis hit. In 2008, the Democrats essentially surrendered to the anti-tax movement. That April, Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama running for the Democratic nomination for president both promised not to raise taxes on Americans earning less than $250,000 a year. In 2010, President Obama agreed to extend the Bush tax cuts for two years in exchange for a two percentage point reduction in the payroll tax, which was temporary. When the Bush tax cuts expired again at the end of 2012, which would have raised $4 trillion of revenue over the next 10 years, President Obama agreed to extend them all for everyone with less than $400,000 of income. 
$400,000 then became the new democratic threshold for tax increases. When Donald Trump won the presidency in 2016, the first thing that came to House Speaker Paul Ryan's mind was tax cuts. In 2017, with a growing economy and facing large deficits, Congress enacted large tax cuts with only Republican votes. The business tax cuts were made permanent, but the tax cuts for individuals expire in 2025. Extending them will cost an additional $3.5 trillion over the coming 10 years. President Biden has frequently reiterated his campaign promises not to increase taxes on anyone with less than $400,000 of income. He even promised not to use increased funding for the IRS to enhance tax enforcement for people with income below that threshold. Biden's new budget proposes many large tax increases for millionaires and billionaires and for large corporations. He proposed most of these changes previously, but in 2022, he failed to get any tax increases for the richest Americans or even to close notorious income and estate tax loopholes despite Democratic congressional majorities. In 2023, he agreed to cut back increases in IRS funding in order to get the Republican votes necessary to increase the debt ceiling. Republican anti-tax advocates continue to cling to disproven and conflicting economic claims. First, that cutting taxes will increase government revenues or at the extreme, cutting taxes is the only way to, cut, to increase government revenues. Secondly, that lowering taxes will necessarily starve the beast by cutting government spending. These two ideas not only conflict, but have also been proven false by nearly a half century of experience. My book shows how antipathy to taxes and to the IRS along with support for tax cuts no matter the nation's economic or fiscal condition, became the glue holding together the Republican coalition. It is the one thing that business elites, Christian evangelicals, the Tea Party, Reagan conservatives, and MAGA populists all agree on. A largely overlooked part of the story, however, is how Democrats initially supported and even enhanced Ronald Reagan's tax cuts and then ultimately surrendered to the anti-tax movement. Unlike more prominent social movements like the Civil Rights Movement and the Women's Movement, the anti-tax movement has yet to suffer a setback this century. So where does this leave us? Despite ongoing large deficits and unprecedented federal debt, Republicans refuse to raise taxes on anyone, and Democrats refuse to raise taxes on 98 percent of anyone. Let me close with a few words about the national debt and rising interest costs. According to the Congressional Budget Office, the federal debt held by the public will equal 99 percent of GDP this year, the highest amount since the end of World War II. Then Europe and Japan were in post-war shambles, and China was entering into a dark communist era. The U.S. economy was poised to enjoy robust, widespread economic growth for decades. Ninety-eight percent of the federal debt was then owned to Americans. CBO estimates that the federal debt will reach the highest level ever recorded in the next decade, and they assume that the $3.5 trillion of Trump tax cuts expiring at the end of 2025 will not be extended. That will not happen. In 2023, revenues were 16.5 percent of GDP, while outlays were 22.7 percent. In the decade ahead, CBO expects spending to hover around 23 percent, 
of GDP, while under CBO's optimistic scenario, revenues never reach 18 percent. This year, interest on the national debt is 3.1 percent of GDP, greater than economic growth, a relationship that is not likely to change. Interest is now the fastest growing federal expenditure, greater than federal government spending on Medicaid, children, Medicare, or defense. Only Social Security costs more. And 30 to 35 cents of every dollar of interest is paid to foreigners, some of whom are not our friends. Long-term projections should be taken with a healthy dose of salt, but CBO projects that by 2052, interest costs will be an unprecedented and unthinkable 7% of GDP. This assumes that the United States can continue to borrow unlimited amounts without sparking an economic crisis. We all hope that's right, but what happens if it's not? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Michael. Uh, I'm David Wessel, director of the Hutchins Center on Fiscal and Monetary Policy here at Brookings. I'm really <coughs> pleased to be moderating this panel. I've never taken a class with Michael Gratz since I haven't spent a day in law school. Um, but he's been a teacher of mine about tax since I was at the Wall Street Journal and Michael was at the Treasury, sometimes complimenting on how, me on how smart my analysis was and sometimes explaining to me why I got everything asked backwards, but I guess that's what a good teacher does. Um, I have a great panel here today, and I wish I could have come up with a joke about how we have a political scientist, a lawyer, and an economist walking into Brookings, but I failed. Uh, so if you have a good one during the question and answer, I'm, I'll entertain that. Uh, to my left is Vanessa Williamson. She's the political scientist. She's a senior fellow in governance studies here at Brookings and a senior fellow at the Tax Policy Center. She studies taxation, redistribution, and political participation, and very relevant for this conversation today, one of her several books is called Read My Lips, Why Americans Are Proud to Pay Taxes, which, which combines survey data and some in interviews she did about how Americans look at tax paying. Uh, she's also written with Theda Scopo, Scopo, Scotch Pole, Scotch Pole, Scotch Pole. Uh, The Tea Party and the Remaking of Republican Conservatism, and because she still thinks books sell, as everybody else on this panel does, her current book project is Taxation for <laughs> Representation, which traces the role of tax policy in the advances and reversals of American democracy. Um, Stephen Dean is the Paul Siskin Research uh, Scholar and Professor of Law at Boston University Law School. He is formerly Vice Dean Dean, uh, that's Vice Dean Stephen Dean of Brooklyn Law School, and was faculty director of the NYU Law School's graduate tax program for a time. His current book is a project is called Global Jim Crow, Taxation and Racial Capitalism, which explores the impact of Africa's decolonization on the trajectory of the global tax regime. His most recent book is, and Steve, I don't know about this title thing. This seems like you've got a lot of words in here. For-profit philanthropy, elite power, and the threat of limited liability companies, donor advised funds, and strategic corporate giving. Um, nice. You should have talked to nice. Grover Norquist about slogans. <laughs> uh, and Doug holtz is, of course, the president of the American Action Forum, which he founded. He previously served as the chief economist at the White House Council of Economic Advisors and director of the Congressional Budget Office. Um, Michael's book is a very good history, and he gave you a great overview. I just want to mention, he mentioned one great anecdote, the uh, wonderful... Uh, Grover Norquist's father and how he is uh, licking the kids' ice cream and, and dooming us to an anti-tax world. Um, I want to point out two other things that I found, two other nuggets that I found particularly uh, delicious, although they didn't involve ice cream. One is on page 71, he revealed, I never knew this, Michael, that in 1980, Reagan had a slogan, let's make America great again. Mm -hmm. So Donald Trump isn't even original on that. Um, and secondly, you know, the History of the 1986 uh, Tax Reform Act is there, 
the kind of tax shelters had gotten so out of control that even ordinary people could explain they were nuts. But I had never heard the story about how the Navy, unable to get congressional appropriations for 13 ships, actually had companies pay for the ships, and then the Navy leased them back, and the companies got the tax breaks and the depreciation uh, uh, as a way to, uh, that, that was an incredible tax shelter. Uh, uh, also in France, they copied it, their Navy, and the U.S. Air Force with uh, refueling tankers. Long history of this one. Well, I didn't know that. Uh, Vanessa, let me start with you. Yeah. So help me understand, you think Americans like to pay taxes, and Michael's book is about how successful the campaign is getting in convincing people we shouldn't pay taxes. So can you both be right? Yeah, I think there's, it's such an important question because there's a real contradiction here, right? So my book is about how Americans are proud to pay taxes, um, and it addresses a, a truism of uh, public opinion research, which is that Americans express a lot of pride in tax pay, right? Uh, and that extends across a bunch of different fields. For example, Americans have very high tax morale. They pay tax uh, uh, with better regularity and, frankly, more honesty than in many other countries, and they express a lot of positive sentiments about that responsibility. So they see tax paying as a civic duty. They see it as a part of being a patriotic American, right? Um, and so my book talks about where those attitudes come from. But at the same time, of course, you know, th those attitudes might surprise you. So just to pick one statistic, uh, if you ask Americans, uh, is it every American's responsibility to pay their fair share of taxes? Something like 95% of Americans will say yes. Now, to get 95% of Americans to agree on something is genuinely very unusual. And by the way, this has held for decades. Um, so an equivalent, I went to look in the survey data for uh, polls that had similar results, and you have to ask, like, is the moon landing real, right? So this is close to a consensus view as Americans get. So how can that be? How can it be that Americans have this very, I mean, genuinely positive tax morale, and our politics look so different? And the, the reason for that, at its core, and I think that's what this book gets to in a, such an important way, is that policy outcomes are not the result of politicians examining uh, public opinion data and then doing what Americans want, right? And we all know this sort of in our hearts, but there's sort of a naive assumption that the policy results we get are the consequence of what Americans are choosing. And that's not how politics works. We all know this. Politics uh, is the uh, battle between organized interests operating through a party system over power, right? So the political results we get are not just some sort of average of what people would like to see. And this is true on taxation. It's true on many other issues. You can think of gun control, for example, as something where Americans have very high levels of support for certain gun control measures. These do not occur, right? Um, and so you might think of this book in some ways as sort of the equivalent of a book about the history of the NRA, how a movement that does not have popular support for everything it wants to do manages to achieve particular ends. And I'll I'll wrap up with two things. Uh, first, one of the things that Americans hold uh, uh, very strongly is the belief that corporations and the wealthy should be paying more in taxes. If you ask people, what bothers you most about the tax system? The top two concerns are with absolute consistency. The corporations are not paying enough. Wealthy people are not paying enough. And if you look at the long-term trajectory of our tax code over the period that this book covers, you'll see that that concern is not what is commonly being addressed, right? Or at least it's frequently not what is being addressed. And so that's, that's one thing that I think this book really provides, is, a, is an analysis of how politics actually happens and how politics can result in outcomes that are not particularly popular. Um, the other thing that I think this book gets to, and this actually relates to another line of my work, the, T the Tea Party book that you kindly mentioned. Um, so on the one hand, there's, it's, it's kind of lovely that Americans have this strong civic attitude about tax paying. I, I like that myself. Um, but unfortunately, that attitude is wrapped up with another belief uh, that Michael talks a little bit about, which is the idea that some other Americans are not taxpayers. They are not doing their share. They are, in the sort of language of Mitt Romney, you know, expecting government to do things for them, and they're not doing their part. Now, reality is it, it would be almost literally impossible to live in the United States and not be a taxpayer. It is mandated by law, and tax paying occurs every time you buy something, own something, work. I mean, it's just we're all taxpayers. Uh, but the belief that there are people who are not 
and this is a deeply racialized belief, right, that has been a critical component of this movement to achieve tax ends that are, in fact, not especially popular. So you're, you're absolutely right. I think that this book, in a way, answers a question embedded in my work, uh, which is how can it be that our politics and our people have such different um, goals? Well, let me push you on this a minute. So. Um... I buy that we do have a remarkable tax system and that most people actually pay, fill out their, their 1040s and pay their taxes. And uh, some people cheat, but my guess is that a lot fewer than could cheat, given how hard it is to catch people. I buy that. And I buy that people say everybody should pay their fair share. But I think you got to what my reservation was. When people say everybody should pay their fair share, they mean somebody else should pay more, not me. And so do you really think that if we had a referendum in the United States that most people would vote to raise their taxes if they thought they were getting something from it? So I, we sometimes test this question, uh, at least at a state or local level. Right. Uh, and tax increases pass, right? I mean, Prop 13, we talked about a little bit before, um, absolutely very famous tax limitation in California, other famous tax limitations. California has the highest state income tax rate because the Californians voted for it again and again. And well, the sales tax. Mostly tax really rich people in California. Mostly, but the sales tax has also increased on the same principle. Mm-hmm. And that's true in a, generally, although not as liberal as its reputation. <laughs> California is not as liberal as its reputation, but it also turned conservative states. Places like Arizona have managed to raise their sales tax by ballot measure. So I think the, it's not the case that, of course, Americans would always like to pay more any more than it is true that they would always like prices to go up, right? If you ask people, should prices be lower? Americans will certainly tell you yes, right? Same thing, they would like taxes to be lower, too. Costs are, are something that people aren't that thrilled about. But Americans' attitudes about taxes are much more subtle uh, than the rhetoric that a very successful social movement has made sort of the currency of American politics. And I think that this book is such a helpful, such a helpful corrective in understanding how that rhetoric became something that we imagine all Americans to believe. Right. And I should mention, I don't think Bill did, that one of Michael's earlier books is about the estate tax and how a movement convinced a whole lot of people who will never, ever, ever have enough money to be subject to the estate tax to be against it. So that makes your point. Uh, I'm going to turn to you, Doug. So if you listen to Michael, particularly at the end, (coughs) he says, we have a big debt. The debt is growing. Mm -hmm. That's a fact. I think that's another thing that everybody agrees on, that debt is growing, Americans. Uh, We're real solid on arithmetic. Uh, yeah, well, 50-50. <laughs> Although, I'm a little worried these days. I'm not sure if you ask people, is the moon landing real, that we get your 95%. <laughs> I haven't checked in the lot. last few years. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, Doug, uh, I kind of feel like there's another half of the story, which is we got a deficit because we cut taxes or didn't raise them enough. But we also, over the period that Michael writes about, spent a lot of money. He mentioned the prescription drug benefit on benefits. So how do you weigh that uh, balance when you think about the political economic history of the period Michael's writing, say, since the end of the 70s? So so I will answer that question, but let me just first say, um, I think you should read this book. This is a beautifully written book. It's an extensively researched book. And you may enjoy the book. I didn't. (laughs) <laughs> um, it, it covered the, the period of my career, so it was all PTSD. Every page, something came back. <laughs> um, and, and I certainly would hope you don't believe the book. Uh, it was a, a, a Brookings <laughs> this economist. This is a hell of an endorsement, Mike. There you have it. <laughs> um, it was a Brookings economist, Charles Schultz, who critiqued supply-side economics by saying, there's nothing wrong with supply-side economics that can't be fixed by division by 10. And I would say the same thing is true of the claims in this book, uh, in part because it leaves out half of the, the battle, which is the spending side. You could write the same book about the progressive nanny state movement, which has, on every occasion, extended entitlements, added new programs. Taxes have gone up, down, and sideways, but spending has only gone up, and expansions have always happened, and we've never reversed any of them. And so you you could sort of replicate this in in exactly that way, and I think leaving that out is um, incomplete because the threshold decision you make in government is to spend the money, and then you decide how to finance it. And to leave out the threshold decision, I think, is, is incomplete. And that's my major reservation with the book. Um, you know, I, I'm deeply concerned, as, as Michael is, with the, con- the state of America's 
uh, public finances and, and, the, and the outlook for the future. I think everyone in this room should be deeply concerned. Um, uh, but I don't think you can just ha hand it on one side of the budget uh, equation. You've got to look at both sides. That's the key. All right. Now, one of the things that's been uh, that Michael talked about correctly, in my view, that a lot of the anti-tax movement was driven by people who thought some poor people were getting their money and they weren't working for it, right? There's that theme. Mm -hmm. But it seems to me we've reached a point now where uh, Social Security and Medicare are seen as, uh, as if they were enshrined in the Constitution. Uh, uh, Joe Biden and, and Donald Trump sort of do this minuet where each one accuses the other one of cutting it because they know. So we've developed an anti-tax pro-benefit uh, philosophy at the moment. Is that, do you read it that way? And uh, I, I do, and I, I'm, I'm really concerned about it. I mean, you know, um, I don't have any friends because I walk around talking like this, but I, we're going to spend <laughs> $82 trillion over the next 10 years. $12 trillion of it's going to be uh, interest. $20 trillion of it will be the annual discretionary spending of Congress. $50 trillion, the vast majority, is on autopilot. It's, it's the mandatory spending, the entitlements, and 32 of that are Social Security and Medicare, which everyone running for president has sworn not to touch. And you That's think, the money. I mean, do you, you think that people are willing to pay higher taxes to, quote, save Social Security and Medicare? So here's the problem. Um, they're big. They're also growing faster than any tax base can plausibly grow. Uh, Social Security is going to grow to 5.5% over the next 10 years every, on average. Aging society. Largely. Yeah, and, and Medicare is 7 so non revenues grow at roughly the rate of the nominal economy. So we're looking to get 2% growth with 2% inflation. We're going to get 4% growth. So those are diverging. They're huge and diverging. So if you raise taxes, you patch the problem for a while. But you have to get the, the, the growth rate of those programs down hmm. to match the economy or you'll never fix it. Hmm. Steve, uh, one of the themes of Michael's book is uh, consistent with the themes of things you've written about, about how something on its surface seems completely unrelated to questions of race. I mean, taxes are, you want rich people to pay, you don't want to pay. It's how we distribute the cost of government. It seems kind of like a pretty um, antiseptic dollar and cents thing, you know, the famous Russell Long thing, don't tax me, don't tax thee, tax the guy behind the tree. But the book talks a lot about how the anti-tax movement harnessed uh, race uh, to sort of supercharge the movement, as he mentioned on the the issues of the IRS tax, uh, the way we tax segregation academies. So I'm wondering, to what extent uh, can you amplify that or criticize how Michael tells that story? Sure. And I just want to say, before I say anything, I'm so delighted to be here. I was a student of Michael's several years ago. Should we just say that? A few years um, ago. And so uh, I'm, I'm grateful to him for having got me started in this and to um, everybody for having me here today. Um, and I want to you know, congratulate Michael, on a, on a great book, much better title than my last one. I, <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> no, no, that's, that's, that's uh, to totally fair. Um, and I, I think that one of the things that's so exciting about it to me is that it really does uh, do something unusual for a tax book, um, uh, and that's address the role of race. Uh, and, you know, I, I think uh, certainly I would have written it differently, and that's, that's fine. Um, and... It's really important, though, to acknowledge that um, what, you know, merely addressing the role of race is, it's really revolutionary in this area, which is unfortunate. Um, uh, it, it's something that I know Vanessa has done uh, mm -hmm. several times, but it's, it's really not something that's done nearly enough uh, or, or nearly comprehensively enough. So just to give an example um, in this context, um, it is certainly true that the anti-tax movement uh, was able to uh, supercharge its ideas uh, by invoking race in ways subtle and not so subtle. Uh, but it's the story of race and tax is much more complicated. Uh, it's much more complicated. Uh, it's certainly true. Um, you know, I will disagree with one thing. Michael said the anti-tax movement has suffered a setback, uh, and uh, that is actually. Um, uh, been uh, accomplished through the use of race again on the other side. So the left will uh, use, um, and I've written a lot about this, uh, will uh, use uh, tax havens, uh, which is code for countries that are majority black, uh, as a way to promote uh, gl the global minimum tax, guilty and so on. So those are areas where we actually have, everybody can agree, 
that we should tax Bermuda and the Cayman Islands, even though we're really talking about Switzerland and uh, Ireland. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so that is one area where race has uh, allowed us to increase taxes. So it's, it's a, just a much more complicated dynamic um, than I, I think is, uh, is really portrayed in the book. But again, I, I'm not going to quibble with uh, you know, uh, not getting everything perfect, because I think introducing the power that race has to shape um, attitudes, and I think that's partly uh, something that Vanessa was addressing in her response, you know, there, there's sort of the rational uh, answer uh, that people have, uh, but you know, they're talking about a, sort of a, a world they don't necessarily believe exists. Uh, so if they were in that world, they'd all be for taxes, but uh, they're, they're, they think they're living in a, in a darker uh, reality uh, where they're not going to get the things they're promised. Um, uh, those are going to go to somebody else. So I, I would say that. And I, I would say uh, one last thing. You know, I, so I, I, I know the book is called The Power to Destroy, How the Anti-Tax Movement Hijacked America, and so I expected nothing but unrelenting bad news, and that's true. <laughs> but I didn't necessarily expect it uh, to be so personal and on the second, in the second sentence. Uh, so where he says, um, during the half of the century from the late 1920s until the late 1970s, much the same could be said about taxes. People across the land complained about taxes but did nothing about it which you know, uh, was sad for me because the book uh, <laughs> that was mentioned is all about how um, uh, during the period from the late 1920s uh, through the 19, early 1970s, uh, 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 race has been used uh, to uh, recreate the global, uh, the global tax regime. Um, and uh, you know, so I think that there are much more complicated stories to tell. Uh, that story, Global Jim Crow, uh, it talks about how Jim Crow um, uh, and its ideas were used to reshape uh, that system. But you could also tell a story about uh, the way Jim Crow uh, operated throughout that era. Um, and uh, I'll read if I can find my little. So this is a quote from a book uh, by uh, Camille Walsh. Let's see. So her book is uh, Racial Taxation, School Segregation, and Taxpayer Citizenship, uh, 1869 to 1973. Uh, and she calls out, uh, uh, quote, unequal tax structures deployed by all white school boards and excise boards. Uh, and she says that they ensured that black schools received a tiny fraction of the resources due them, and that in many cases, African Americans were doubly taxed for the support of white schooling. So it's certainly true that during that period, uh, tax and race uh, lived a complicated life together. Um, and uh, I think that you know, it's certainly true that the timing that Michael uh, proposes is correct that somehow after Jim Crow ends in the mid-1960s, by the 1970s, uh, tax becomes much less popular. Because if, uh, you know, this is Ira Cass Nelson's book, uh, uh, When Affirmative Action Was White, you know, there's a time when affirmative action was incredibly popular, and it was when blacks were excluded from it. Mm -hmm. So if you can uh, have the tax system be uh, openly discriminatory, uh, then <laughs> fewer people have a problem with it. But when you have to treat blacks fairly, uh, all of a sudden tax becomes a much more complicated proposition. So. You know, I, I think that what Michael has done is extraordinary. Uh, the book is amazing. Uh, and again, I, I, I didn't live through it, but it was even hard to read for somebody who didn't live through it. Um, uh, but certainly all true and important uh, for people to know. Uh, and there's just, there's just more. You know, so maybe, maybe Michael's next book will do, uh, will do more on race, and that'd be great. Uh, but uh, I'm not going to quibble with what he's done here, which is really important, I think. Right. I should say that Global Jim Crow is a much better title. So you definitely <laughs> learned from experience. <laughs> Uh, Michael, a couple of things have come up, and I want to get your response. Maybe we could start. Um, so this is the classic, like, um, why didn't you write a different book, Michael? Right? <laughs> so I'll give you a pass on that one. But what do you think of Vanessa's analysis that basically taxes are, would be more popular, are, actually are more popular, but it's the organized tax opponents who move the politicians? Well, the political science literature is clear that the legislative process does not reflect the views of the average American. And so on that, we agree entirely. And I don't think there's any doubt about it. And it favors money. <laughs> this is not a surprise. I mean, this should not be news at this, at this stage. So that moneyed interests do better in legislative politics than an unmoneyed interest, and you mentioned the estate tax book, and that's a perfect example, I think, of that. 
uh, 60 percent of the American people we found when we were writing that book supported the repeal of the estate tax, and uh, 2 percent of the American decedents were paying the estate tax at the time. And we also found, I guess it may have been a little more optimistic time then, that more than 40 percent of the American people believed that they would be in the top 1 percent when they died. <laughs> um, so, you know, this was an optimistic country, at least at that point. It's become more pessimistic, I think, since. Um, so, so I, you know, I think there is a reconciliation between what Vanessa has written and, and what, what I have written, which is mostly about the legislative process. The, the one countervailing point is all of the referendums to reduce property taxes and so forth. And she's right that there have been a number of referendums in recent years to raise sales taxes. And so I think the kinds of taxes that we're talking about also matter in the sense that it, the sales tax, and nobody in this room could tell you how much sales tax they paid last year because they just don't know. They pay, you know, a dime here and a dime there, and pretty soon it's, it's a dollar or two or more. Um, property taxes, people sit down and write a check for twice a year, um, and they know how much property taxes they're paying on their houses if they own their houses. The renters don't know, but the owners know. And so the question of which taxes are salient, uh, and then uh, there's other literature that basically says that if you earmark taxes, that you'll get more votes. And so, for example, um, the area in Colorado where they've built a very impressive light rail system, including from the Denver airport to Denver, was approved in a referendum that raised the sales tax because people knew that they were going to get something they wanted for what they were, what they were spending. And so there are ways that I think you can get popular support even in referendums for, for taxes, but it, it, it has to be done in a way that, that they will approve of. So I think, you know, I think there's, there's, there's some distance between, you know, people like to pay taxes and, and tax the guy behind the tree. Uh, but, uh, but, but I think Vanessa and I are, are not in major disagreement about, about this. What about uh, unlike Doug? What about know. Doug's? <laughs> That's why we invite Doug. You know, um, what about Doug's assertion that you kind of looked at the world with one eye closed and the other eye is where we're spending all the money? Well, you know, I, I took Doug's uh, admonition that I didn't write a different book um, as a suggestion that. Doug should write that book. <laughs> uh, you know, that's Doug, that's Doug's be with the title. Doug. That's Doug's book. <laughs> yes, that's, that's Doug's book, not not my book. Um, but but the uh, I mean the point about spending. I mean obviously the deficits. You know you have to have more spending than you have taxes in order to have deficits. Um, but, you know, I mean, when Ronald Reagan left the presidency, spending was over 20 percent, and that was before we had the aging population that we now do. And it's true that the, there are lots of problems with spending. I mean, I, in a book I wrote long ago, complained that the government spending was tilted toward the elderly and the federal government did way too little for children. And so they're making up for it now by tax cuts for children, including refundable tax cuts, which Doug probably thinks is spending, which wouldn't, wouldn't surprise me. Yeah. Uh, I can understand that. That makes sense. Um, I, you know, the spending is an issue. I, you know, you can only write one book at a time. And I'm not planning to write the book about spending because I think it's clear that spending is not going to come down from about you know, pick your number, 21, 22 percent. I mean, it's now more than that. If you look at the big increases in spending this century, you know, spending exploded during the great financial crisis, which is a one-time story. Spending exploded during the, the COVID uh, crisis, which is a one-time story. Um, one hopes that the war in Iraq 
in Afghanistan was a one-time story, but one can't be sure about defense spending. Um, but that accounts for most of the spending growth during, during this century. Now, it is true that we have an aging society, um, and, but every time we've come to grips with either deficits or with entitlements as a, as a, as a success, and I'm now I'm not talking, the Republicans have proposed endlessly, Paul Ryan uh, most famously in 2012, I do talk about this in the book, by the way, that in 2012, he wanted to privatize Social Security. Ronald Reagan, I talk about, wanted to privatize Social Security. That would eliminate that spending. The American people don't want to privatize Social Security. George W. Bush learned that when he thought he had a mandate to, to privatize Social Security. So, you know, those, those entitlements of Medicare, and Medicare growth has, has actually, as you know well, not grown at the percentage that people thought it would grow because of, of some uh, savings in, in health care uh, spending. Uh, so that per capita, it hasn't, it hasn't, per capita for the age population, it hasn't grown as much as it was anticipated to grow. And if the Republicans, again, it's the Republicans, I mean, I am not, just to be clear, I do not forgive the Democrats in this story. I'm quite uh, concerned with the way the Democrats behaved from the beginning through now. But, you know, it was the Republicans that said that the federal government couldn't negotiate prescription drug prices when they put in a prescription drug benefit. That was a Republican uh, proposal. Um, so, so, you know, I don't think we're going to get spending down. You know, we've got an aging population. We're spending less than most other countries are spending in our federal government. And so the question is, how, are you, how low are you going to get with spending? And so, you know, I should ask Doug this question. How low do you want to get with federal? I mean, what's your, what's your expectation of how low federal spending can go? And then, if it's 21 or 22 percent, which I suspect it is, you've got 16 and a half percent being collected in taxes. And so you've got to talk about taxes in order to do this. And there is this adamant opposition to taxes, which I confess is the lens through which I looked at this book. And so I, you know, but I don't apologize for that. I merely confess that, 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 that that's uh, right, the way so I looked at it. Let me, let me frame the question you put to Doug. So, yes, it is true that we had some one-off that increased spending. And undoubtedly, we'll have some other one-offs in the future. I mean, I think we're going to build a new build bridge in Baltimore uh, soon. Yep. Um, but when CBO does its projections, uh, spending goes up and up and up, largely because we have an aging society and because they expect health care spending, despite what you said about Medicare, yep. which is true, to grow faster than other things. And that's, yes. those are the basic drivers. Yes. So, Doug, um, uh, I don't think, I hope, we're not going to solve the aging problem by having another pandemic and killing off a lot of old people. We don't seem to be uh, doing much on the fertility side of natives. There is an issue about what, how much immigration can help us. I agree. Thing. But I think Michael makes the fundamental point that there's going to be, an, because we're an aging society and because we have a taste for medical care as we get ri richer, we're going to have an inexorable rise in spending. So raising taxes as a percentage of GDP is pretty much going to have to be part of the equation if we care about the debt. So how, how, was, how do you think this will play out, and particularly politically? So, so a, a couple of points. Number one, I, I don't disagree with that. that, with that. I mean, we're, I think we're going to have to raise taxes. That's, that's the reality. <clears throat> um, my point was that if you look back over the same period, um, the, the folks who wanted more social programs, more spending programs, mandatory spending programs, uniformly won, and they ran off efforts to, to change the, the nature of the ones that we had. So in terms of the, the thematics of the book he actually wrote, I think you can write this, the, take those thematics and, and get with the same dynamics. Look, I'm talking about, okay, we're looking event? at the next 50. <laughs> but here's the thing. Here's I'm looking the, ahead, 50, we're looking ahead for the next 20 years. So, we're on a course to have inexorably rising spending, even if we uh, do a little belt tightening and tweak Medicare Advantage and stuff. And we're going to have to even though we're going to have a huge and growing debt. So you're going to have to do something there. Or we're going to raise taxes. And I wonder how you see that playing out. 
Poorly. <laughs> Poorly. I mean, look, the, the litmus test is going to be at the end of 2025, we get the sunset of the 2017 tax act and the sunset of the premium tax credits that, that fund the ACA, expand with yeah. the ACA. And in, in a world of fiscal rationality, we might see the taxes go up and the, the spending go down, and, and we won't. We'll see the spending preserved and the tax cuts preserved, and, and we'll, we'll have um, you know, another step toward the abyss. And do you, what, what conclusion do you draw about the fact that, for the first time in my recent memory, Congress seems unable to pass this tax cut that has a little bit for corporations and a little bit for the child tax credit? Is uh, that a sign of something, or is that just a sign of gridlock rather than a sea change in gross well, Chuck Grassley has the unfortunate habit of telling the truth in public, and he said, we're not going to send checks to people in an election year. It's not going to happen. And a whole lot of businesses are not going to get their R&D tax credit as a price of that. Until later. Yeah, I see. Um, Steve, I wonder so, if you... Dave, just, just one point. Yeah. Spending did not rise inexorably through all of these presidents. Spending went down, if you look at it, during the Clinton presidency. And it went down from the time that Barack Obama took office, when it was very high because of the, of the great financial crisis, when he was president. So there are two exceptions that I found, just looking at the spending side, to when spending actually went down during a presidency. Oddly enough, they were Democratic presidents and not Republican President's spending did go up um, in the other times. Now, granted, you know the Obama case is an, is an outlier because of. Yeah, I think there are a lot of economists that argue that it was a mistake that we should have increased spending more after the global financial crisis. Yes. We wouldn't have such. A yeah. So, yeah. Steve, I wonder if you could. Well, and and there are people who have written books <laughs> that say that it was a huge mistake for Obama to extend all the Bush tax cuts in 2013, in 2010. I could forgive him because he had a, an economy that was fragile. He had other priorities and so forth, and he, had not, and he wanted to run for re-election in 2012. So, you know, give him a pass on 2010. In 2013, he was no longer running for re-election. He could have simply, by doing nothing, brought the Congress into a series of negotiations over the Bush tax cuts, and he didn't. And so, you know... He was very much, in my view, at fault for that, although I don't know where others would come out on that. Vanessa's trying to get a word in. Yeah, yeah I mean, I think there are a couple, <laughs> you know, sort of thinking about next year, there's a parallel in the sense that having things expire solves one of the problems that you raised, which is mm -hmm. the gridlock problem to some degree. That is to say, the outcome, if nothing happens, uh, would be more revenue, right? And so I think that it would be interesting to see if under, you know, under the condition, the political conditions will be in that year, which is certainly up in the air. Uh, but uh, you know, a Biden president, for example, might learn, oh, be able to take a lesson from that previous moment, right? If after, the, after a re-election, you're in a position where you at minimum have, typically you have inertia standing as perhaps the most important legislator in the United States, right? right? And for once, that would not be the, like an absolutely fundamental hurdle. Well, I wish I had your optimism because uh, you Joe, Biden, Joe Biden negotiated the 2013 extension with Mitch McConnell. But, and, they, and, they, and, the, and the $400,000 number that Joe Biden sticks to religiously came out of that negotiation. That's where the, that's where the tax increase went. So uh, Biden has said true. he's not going to raise taxes a penny on anybody below $400,000. So I don't see how he lets everything expire. And then, I mean, you can blame it on somebody else, I suppose, but I don't, I'd, I'd be surprised if that's what he Bring does. you back, Michael, to be the MC of the Andrews Air Force Base Summit, where you can come out with no. everybody holding hands. I know how much you enjoyed that the last time, so. That was miserable. <laughs> that was miserable. <laughs> Doug and, I, Doug and I both whispered that was miserable. That we, that we agree on 100%. It, right. it, was, I think, I think, it was 11 days, and it seemed like two years. Um, yeah, but these days they have 11-day summits, and they don't even get an agreement out of right. it. So at least right. you had that going for you. Steve, can you reflect a little bit on the ways in which you think, it, this is going beyond the history of Michael's book, but I'm just interested, the ways in which you think race is still... 
um, an issue in the current way we tax? Where are the where are the flashpoints that you think we don't appreciate how uh, something that would, on the surface isn't uh, discriminatory, but in practice is? Sure. Thanks for the question. Um, and for this, I'm going to lean on Dorothy Brown, whose book, The White is the Wealth, if you haven't read it, go get it today. Um, so she talks a lot about the way in which um, race uh, plays out in unexpected ways. She tells the story of her parents. Um, her parents, uh, during Jim Crow, uh, thanks to uh, legal and ubiquitous discrimination, uh, both worked. Uh, and this was more common for uh, black Americans than for white Americans, who could, thanks to discrimination, comfortably have one spouse work. So the way this played out was, um, and you know, Michael's written a lot about the marriage penalty, and I assume everybody here uh, uh, understands that jargon that for certain uh, married couples, uh, they get a benefit by getting married. Uh, those are ones with unequal incomes, and those with similar incomes pay a marriage penalty when they get married. Uh, Dorothy Brown has shown that the marriage penalty is uh, very racialized. Um, so this is one way in which, you know, I, I, I do not believe that legislators are uh, thinking uh, this, uh, this just sort of strategically, that they see that uh, they can exploit uh, race uh, uh, and the marriage penalty. I, I just think it, you know, it's a question of what, pressure points uh, they can, uh, you know, and what kind of leverage they can apply to get the results that they want to get. Um, and they're more willing to uh, harm blacks uh, in order to do that. So even in the recent changes uh, uh, to uh, that have, so as, as more white couples have become two earner couples, uh, this has made the marriage penalty uh, politics different. So it's reduced the marriage penalty uh, for uh, most couples, including the increasingly large share of uh, white couples that are two earner couples. Um, but those changes didn't trickle down to um, EITC payers. Uh, so there's still a, you know, a, a terrifying marriage penalty that applies to EITC taxpayers. The earned income tax credit. Yeah. Or, sorry, the income tax credit. So one of the biggest subsidies for uh, uh, low income workers uh, you know, a really powerful, um, a really powerful uh, intervention. Uh, but you can still see, um, and, and it's the EITC itself is very racialized. Even though more whites than blacks receive it, it's perceived as a black part of the tax law. Uh, so you would still get that marriage penalty uh, playing out in that space. So it, it, I think it tends to be in, in some areas, like that I write about, it's not very subtle at all. Uh, but in these areas. The way it plays out uh, and the way these uh, racial political dynamics persist uh, are very subtle. Uh, and it, you know, it takes like somebody like Dorothy Brown uh, sitting around the kitchen table with her parents uh, to realize uh, what's going on. Uh, so that's, I think that's how it plays out really today. Yeah. Thanks. Oh, can I'll I just jump in? The audience, but please. Yeah, yeah, I mean, just sort of following up on this point, I think that also helps set the stage for this book in a way. Because if you look at how the federal government supports the welfare of the citizens, um, traditionally a lot of supports uh, in, on the tax side right, were uh, preferentially beneficial to white people. So if you think about things like the home mortgage interest deduction, right, this uh, rewards wealthier people and therefore traditionally in today whiter families. Uh, and also uh, white families have the advantage of not facing the housing market discrimination that black families have historically and still today. So on the tax side, we have these big expenditures that support white families in ways that are invisible, to follow up on Michael's point, right? about This is a way that we shift huge sums to white homeowners, but it doesn't look like you're getting a benefit from the government. Right? But then on the other side, when we do spending, those were the programs that were so deeply racialized, that so much attention was drawn to about welfare. Right? But that's spending welfare. Tax welfare also exists and has traditionally been so much less visible that it played into this dynamic of thinking that there are these people over here who pay taxes and these other people who don't. And so I think that this story is exactly right and is actually also sort of an underlying policy landscape that made the anti-tax movement, that the anti-tax movement could la latch onto in a way that was really powerful. Yeah, though I've heard um, some people argue that once the, we got a black middle class that was 
well enough off to take advantage of these things like the home. That's when we decided, oh, we can't afford this anymore. Yeah. Mike, you wanted to say something before so I turn to the audience? So I just um, wanted to quickly say this discussion has revealed the, a lot of nuances between local taxes, property taxes, income taxes at the federal level, sales taxes. And one of, the, I think, the great um, detriments of the anti-tax movement is, is to lump all taxes as the same. Yeah. Up is bad, down is good, and tax policy gets lost entirely. And, the, and the, the art of designing a tax code no longer is what it once was. You think back to 86 and what went into thinking about that reform. The, the public policy discussion now is really sterile as a result of this movement. Close to a lot of economists would prefer more user fees, yeah. but then that's deemed a tax. I mean, the government right. of Connecticut couldn't even get tolls on trucks, right. that, even though most, it's like the estate tax, even though most people wouldn't pay them, it became like all the tolls are coming back. Now let's turn to the audience. Uh, I'm going to take like a couple of questions and then we can see. Uh, let's try and uh, keep the questions to questions. Uh, woman in the blue there. Uh, uh, wait for the mic. Economic wait, security wait, project. Wait for the mic. Hello. I who you are. Oh my God. Wicked loud. So I'm Anna Aurelia with Economic Security Project. Um, quick question having to do with the tax package. Right now, some of us are beating our shoe leather out trying to get a child tax credit increase and making the case that it's long-term good for society and racial equity to target the lowest income kids who are left out of that tax credit. Also, economically speaking, it is, right? Low-income people will go out and spend it right away. We can't make that argument stick. Yet the businesses are getting two years of retroactive R&D that will have zero impact on the economic decisions because they already made those last year, and that is seen as gospel. How do we reverse the dynamic here and have a more honest conversation about the economic impact of our tax policy? Okay, thanks. Uh, Looks like neither side is going to win there. So, Hank? Many years ago, Alicia Manel wrote a book for Brookings in which he established a very simple proposition about the marriage penalty that as long as you had joint filing and a progressive rate structure, it is mathematically impossible to avoid marriage penalties and bonuses. Given that proposition, uh, this is directed to whoever wants to take the question, <laughs> what would you do about the current arrangement to improve equity? Thanks. Uh, there's a gentleman in the back. Sam? Thank you. Um, Leon Peace. Um, mine is more of a uh, political... Can you identify yourself? Right? Oh, Le Leon Peace. I have to say it a Sorry. little louder. Um, uh, politically uh, related, in the political realm, um, my question is concerns, um, I guess, to, to Professor Gratz. Speaker Gingrich um, took particular interest in the, in the tax area. And... Um, for example, subchapter S for banking institutions appeared in the conference report for the tax bill because of his interest. My question is, what impact or how would you quantify his leadership with impact on the tax regime? Okay, Michael, you want to start with the Gingrich question? How, how, how influential was Gingrich and relative to other people like Paul Ryan and Jack Kemp. Well, I mean, you, you raised the 1990 budget negotiations at Andrews, which reached an agreement. And as the negotiators on both sides, Democrats and Republicans, met in the White House and were going into the Rose Garden to announce the agreement, uh, Newt Gingrich told the president, I can't support this. Having been involved in the negotiations and at least some evidence that he had told uh, the president's aides, uh, John Sununu and, and Dick Darman in particular, that he would support the agreement if Phil Graham supported it, a conservative senator at the time. Graham actually did support the agreement. Gingrich uh, ostentatiously walked out uh, when the TV cameras were running of the White House, indicating he would not be in the Rose Garden, and then rallied the Republicans to vote down the agreement, which then resulted in an agreement which actually had more taxes than George uh, Herbert Walker Bush had negotiated. Um, 
Gingrich was very influential. Let us not misunderstand that. Um, and taxes were the one thing that Gingrich cared about as he was consistent over a long period of time. He was inconsistent about everything else, in my experience. <laughs> um, but he was consistent about that, um, and he wanted to lower taxes. Um, I'm not familiar with the, with the subchapter S provision that, that you mentioned, but I'm sure it was important to somebody who told Gingrich it was important to them, and he was responsive to it. Um, but I think his, his biggest uh, uh, impact was undermining uh, the ability to raise taxes in the Republican uh, House in particular, uh, which, which he uh, rallied the troops for along with Dick Armey, who was an anti-tax fellow, and Bob Walker, who, who was an associate of Gingrich's and sort of went along with him from Pennsylvania. So he was very influential. I wouldn't describe that influence as terribly positive on the tax system, but that may be because you know, he threw me out of a room once when we were having a conversation. Well, he tried to throw me out of a room. The Secretary of Treasury wouldn't let him, but that's another, that's another story. <laughs> it was a great time. Um, it was a great time. Have, does, does anybody have a solution to the mental marriage penalty? So, so on the EITC... I mean, this fundamental trilemma that, that uh, Henry attributes to Alicia Minnell, but I would attribute to two others before that. Um, but it's true that you can't have all that. But on the earned income tax credit, the problem is really the way the phase-outs work. Mm -hmm. And you could actually liberalize the phase-outs and reduce the marriage penalties a great deal. But you'd have to spend more money for people who are married that went closer to the middle class. And this is true of phase-outs generally. And if you phase them out based on income and you treat the income as the same for a married couple as for two single people, you're going to have very different results and usually marriage penalties. And so you have them in the spending side in the same way with, with phase-outs. You could, you could have done better. I mean, I take Stephen's point. You could have done better with the earned income tax credit any number of times when it was liberalized and there was no interest in doing so because there wasn't concern about the marriage penalty at the bottom in the way there should have been because uh, there's a lot of evidence that, that marriage penalties are, are really important uh, at the bottom of the income scale. Hmm. Uh, Vanessa, do you have any solution to the how, how, help the economic security project come up with a better argument. That's what she wants your help on that. <laughs> well, I think the, I, I guess my takeaway would be that it doesn't help very much that most people also want the child tax credit. I'm sure you have all the poll data you need on that front, but that's not what gets it done, right? What gets it done is the organizing. So I, that both is maybe a depressing answer, but also would maybe fit, make you feel good about your own personal work. So. But I think off, also, right? like, she makes a good point that retroactive R and D tax credits are stupid. It's a terrible idea. It sort of goes to what <laughs> it's sort of what 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 yeah. Doug says, and I think what's happened. Correct me if you're wrong, Doug, is that people now assume it'll be done retroactively, so they act as if they're going to get it, and someday they'll make it screwed. Right? Yeah. I mean, in the same sense that, like, at the end of uh, this of 2025, this isn't really the deadline for the 2017 act. They'll do it in 26. I mean, they do it retroactively. I mean, they, they, there's no discipline to the process anymore. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there's a gentleman here. It's coming. Wait for the mic because we have a lot of people online. Uh, Bob Boyman. Uh, question, you know, a lot of the fault ends up being laid on Congress or the legislatures for the, for the success of the anti-tax movement. But it's not just their fault. We rely in society on our journalists, on our academics, on our public intellectuals, uh, you guys, to educate uh, the legislatures and the people, et cetera, to make sure that they understand the consequences of these actions. Apparently, if they won, you guys didn't do the job we wanted you to do. So can you explain what could you have been doing? What should you be doing? How do we explain the fact that you guys have so profoundly failed in making sure that the right thing happens, and how do we get this fixed in the future? So, uh, wait, let's, so let's, I, uh, there's two questions here uh, in the middle. Okay. 
and then we'll, and then I have a, I have one. A Let me answer him first. Before to to, ex <laughs> to expand on the failure of, of the liberal side, just look at the inheritance tax. Right. The Republicans called it a death tax. So somebody with an estate of $25,000 said, I'm not going to pay money when I die. And all there was no really good comeback from the liberals to say the inheritance tax applies to people with $5 million, $6 million, $12 million, not $50. The second item is if you don't believe that racism plays a role in congressional way to spend money, just listen to the next week, the discussion about helping Baltimore with an African-American mayor, an African-American governor of the state, and see how many of the MAGA people say, these people don't deserve another bridge. Let them swim across the Patapsco River. Okay, we got the optimistic crowd coming out now. Okay. <laughs> Are you doing a little bit of ray of light? Uh, Rick Ryback with Just Economics. And... The panel spoke about some of the invisible ways that, um, you know, tax policy benefits the rich. And one of the things, talking about the failures of us, uh, is we often, people on our side, support infrastructure spending, new transit, or reducing transit fares. And yet if you do that, the beneficiaries tend not to be transit riders, but the people who own land around the transit stations whose land prices and values go way up. And so a lot of this infrastructure spending is really welfare for people who are already the most powerful and wealthy people. These are the people who own the best served land for infrastructure in our city. So maybe you could speak to that type of failure too. Well, you didn't deliver on the optimistic. <laughs> so um, I was a reporter at the Wall Street Journal when Bob Bartley and Jude Winiski were railing against taxes. And uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, uh, at least in the good old days, there was a pretty high wall between the news department and the editorial page. And we used to say that's true at every newspaper, but at the Wall Street Journal, it's topped with barbed wire. So I had written a story suggesting that cutting taxes would reduce revenue, which was mm -hmm. not part of the Jude Winiski, Bob Bartley thing, which earned me a reference in a Bartley editorial to that. He said some people... There's an argument made that cutting taxes doesn't reduce revenue, an argument that has impressed some of our otherwise serious journalists. <laughs> <laughs> so I tried. <laughs> um, I didn't succeed very well in getting questions, but does anybody want to respond to the uh, assertion? I Steve, just, you want to start? Yeah. Oh, sure. I'll just say one quick thing. I, I'm not certain uh, that addressing race will produce better outcomes. But ignoring it hasn't produced great outcomes either. So that's one of the reasons I'm so glad that Michael has really uh, opened that conversation. And it's a much broader conversation. But we talk about uh, the child tax credit. Certainly, that's part of the reason that uh, it has been so hard to accomplish uh, because of this concern that Vanessa described that you know it's not me who's going to be betting from, but not people who look like me. But, and I, I'm somewhat optimistic uh, that when confronted with this uh, bias, uh, people, many people, not everybody, will say, well, maybe, maybe that's not okay. So I, I'm, not, I'm not certain, but I think that that is at least one way to uh, try something different. Okay. So as a footnote to the, to the estate tax uh, discussion, uh, do you go back to the, the period when it actually got eliminated for a year, the throw mama from a train uh, era? Oh, yeah. um, one of the things that wasn't appreciated at, at that time, and I haven't kept up with, with the recent developments, but at that time, Many, many states had uh, state or inheritance taxes that, that actually kicked in at very low levels. And so what people were mad about was their state law, and that movement captured that uh, animosity at the federal level. And, and I think that gets missed in this discussion a lot. Um, and then in terms of uh, our failure, yeah, um, you know, I've lived my adult life uh, in the with the belief that a better educated, better informed policymaker will make better decisions. There's no empirical evidence that's true. And that's, that's why we're here. So on the estate tax, which is the subject of another book, which I recommend to you. Yeah, what's the title of that book? Uh, so Death by a Thousand Cuts, I think is what it's called. Um, the story is that the Democrats basically kept saying, it won't affect you, it's only going to affect the top 2%. But they never made any other arguments. And um, 
when we wrote the book, we argued that what they should have done was label it the Paris Hilton Relief Act um, <laughs> because it was really about the people who were inheriting the wealth and not the uh, Conrad Hiltons who had built the wealth over their lifetime, which is the way the repeal forces had framed the issue. Um, and, and the country western song that uh, I always used in support of this was, uh, I've never seen a hearse with a luggage rack. Mm -hmm. And so I, th I think that's, but, but it was really a problem of framing. And, and the way these issues get framed and the death tax, putting the, the undertaker and the IRS tax collector side by side was really very, very effective framing. And I do discuss toward the end of the book the framing of some of these issues. Um, and I did discuss a little bit about the, the us who pay taxes versus the others who don't pay taxes and so forth. And I think framing is extremely important in, in, these, in these stories, especially if you're trying to get public opinion on your side, which the anti-repeal forces on the estate tax, as easy as that case should have been for them, never did. So uh, with that, uh, please join me in thanking Michael and our panelists, Doug, Steve, and uh, I, think, uh, I think if you want the books my, where Michael's selling is in the back, yeah, outside. In the bookstore. In the okay, so we have a bookstore. You can get the book, and Michael sign it here. And one favor for our maintenance staff, if there's a coffee cup or something at your feet, if you could put it in the garbage can at the back, it would be appreciated. And thank you all for coming.